Good morning. Bonjour. My name is Christina Perkin Davison, and I'm a proud member of the class of 94, not only at uh, Columbia Business School, but also at SIPA. Uh, I'm delighted to see so many of my classmates here and uh, so many alums. I have met so many people as well. I was honored to be asked to introduce this session this morning titled Preparing Your Business for a Smarter World. CBS has meant a great deal to me. I graduated from Harvard the same year that the Berlin Wall came down, and I was interested in uh, business opportunities in Eastern Europe, promoting market capitalism in the region for, that, that had uh, failed uh, under communist rule, uh, something I enjoy saying. I was looking for an MBA program that could be complemented by a master's degree in international and public affairs. Columbia's MBA and MIA programs were perfectly aligned with my interests. I was also looking for an MBA program that had a truly international student body, because that's where I feel most comfortable in global business, as many of you do as well. Um, and I wanted the best school that was at the heartbeat of business and capital and that could provide access to outstanding business leaders, role models, and teachers. Columbia Business School has all those things. I'm currently involved with Columbia as a member of the Lang Center Advisory Board. And I'm very involved also at speaking in many instances at the Columbia Women in Business events. I'm so grateful to have had all the opportunities that Columbia afforded me. When I was asked by the State Department last fall to speak at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit in India, I knew I was well equipped with my MBA and experience on the ground to share my knowledge and to promote women in business, especially in emerging markets. My education also gave me the tools to co-found and manage iEurope Capital, a VC fund focused on companies developing emerging technologies in Central Eastern Europe. In fact, my business partner, Laszlo Tsiriak, is a CBS grad and head of Columbia's Alumni Club of Hungary. I love being at the cutting edge of cutting edge. I get to see how technology is changing the way we live and work every day. That is why I'm particularly excited to introduce Bernd Schmidt, the Robert D. Calkins Professor of International Business, and faculty director of the Center on Global Brand Leadership, who will be moderating this session. Professor Schmidt researches, teaches, and advises corporations on creative strategy, branding, and customer experience management. He teaches the course Managing Brands, Identity, and Experiences, and won an award for innovation in the classroom for the course Corporate Creativity. He's also the author of several books, one that I had to buy just from the picture on the cover called Experiential Marketing, where he looks like he's skydiving. Is that really you? <laughs> you can't see it, but it looks like it. I had to pick this book up. Columbia Business School's Professor Schmidt. Thank you. And I'll ask my panel to come up with me as well. Uh, this is a very exciting session, I hope, for all of you, because uh, we'll talk about the future, uh, the future technologies that are coming. Uh, you've all seen uh, the world being transformed over the last uh, 15, 20 years through di digital technology, first through the internet, of course, then uh, through e-commerce and the mobile revolution, social media as well. And I think the next wave is starting now, and this next wave of the digital revolution I think will be very, very radical, even more radical than what we've seen in the last 10, 15 years, where, you see, where you've seen your business lives and your personal lives being transformed. Because with this new uh, revolution, we are getting into issues of um, replacing humans uh, with machines, uh, of entirely uh, restructuring our environments by having sensors and other devices that can communicate with each other as part of the Internet of Things. So these are the sorts of issues that we'll talk about, artificial intelligence, um, Internet of Things, and maybe other technologies as well. So I have a very uh, exciting uh, panel here. Uh, all the way over there is Marc Bousquet. He is from Accenture. In fact, he uh, does uh, technology 
for okay. Accenture, the technology business for Accenture, uh, pretty much uh, all across Europe, right? Yeah, uh, right? Focused on France, of course, as well, right? Exactly. Okay, then we have Jean-Philippe Debois. Did I say De this right? Debiol. Okay, <laughs> Jean-Philippe <laughs> Debiol. Uh, Jean-Philippe <laughs> is from uh, IBM Watson, which I think has become a brand, right? Watson, in addition to IBM. And you will see that they do all sorts of things, uh, not just Watson, we will talk about Watson, but there are other issues uh, as well. And uh, we have Tim Campus, okay? Tim Campus is uh, with a company, started a company, co-founded a company that is now called Woven. Shh, we haven't launched yet. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, so can we reveal the name actually, Woven? Or is Woven is the name. Uh, okay. And we'll be launching the company in about two weeks. I'm really excited to be talking about it. Okay, excellent. Um, so we basically have also an entrepreneur with us. Uh, so it's a really, really exciting uh, panel. I hope you'll jump in with questions very, very soon. I'll start it off with a few questions and then uh, we'll take uh, questions from you. Okay? Uh, well, Mark, why don't we start with you? Um, so what new technologies are coming that are sort of interesting to business? Well, it's um, so we, we have some uh, big trends, and of course, there's a long term trends like uh, quantum computing, etc. But for the business, uh, at this moment, we have a chance to do a, um, a big um, uh, work around the trends we, we see, and we see three things very important at this moment. We still have AI, of course, artificial intelligence is key today, and we see a multiplication of bots, etc. What is interesting here is how uh, the technologies will deal with the, the life cycle of a, a robot, for example, or a bot, how uh, you will evolve with your artificial intelligence. So this is very interesting. Second trend is something we know already, but it's now really a whole new world, it's uh, extended reality. For example, in retail, but not only in retail, in training, and a lot of maintenance work are doing now with uh, kind of glasses and a lot of, uh, let's say, extended reality in order to uh, multiply and magnify your experience in your retail, in your store, whatever. So it's really easy for us now, from a technology point of view, it's really good. And the third thing, very important, mostly, the most important is what we call seamless architecture. Architecture. We see at this moment that business is created by platform, of course, and platform to platform. So, for example, if two brands want to collaborate, one of the things and the obstacle we meet is always the ability to make this uh, brand and these companies to work together with the information system, so mm -hmm. the legacies, you know. And in years, we are trying to do API and very smart things. And now we have microservices, we have a lot of different technology, and we start to have really this opportunity to create new architecture. This is probably where the most interesting thing is arriving, with blockchain, for example, which is a kind right. of architecture, but also with the idea that uh, we can do and create smart contracts. And I will explain, if you wish, uh, later on uh, what is exactly smart contract, but let's say that two systems can collaborate to decide and to create a contract without a human uh, in place. When you are, for example, in a, in a plane, and where suddenly you say you receive from your insurance company, if you put five euros and your plane is delayed for two hours, I will pay you 100 euros. Right. This is a kind of smart contract you can face, and this is collaboration between architecture. Well, let me ask you a follow-up question. So we had AI, we had extended reality, which right. is, I guess is virtual or augmented reality. Right. And then we have these uh, 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 infrastructures, uh, right. sort of. Uh, so. From a, where are the obstacles? Are they still at the level of technology, meaning the technology needs to be developed, it needs to be much better in order to be useful, or are there also obstacles that are sort of business management obstacles? Right, good question, because so I think there's two obstacles. It's, uh, the first is, in, we, could, we could say leadership. Um, one of the things is that we are in a, we call it a VUCA world, I don't know if... Uh, so uh, the world is really uncertain and we try to always guess and try to have this step ahead uh, with, with the future of technology. In fact, is creating teams that are able to deal with whatever is the technology arriving and create business with your business, directly with business and not something else. So this is one thing. Is we are talking about culture. We are talking about digital factory, for example. And on the other side, one big obstacle I see is um, this kind of uh, discussion around 
uh, I'm taking care of my data, but I want to collaborate. And this is difficult because here we are talking about business who is very, uh, let's say, conservative with the data, the confidentiality in terms of commerce, for example. And in the other side, they want to collaborate in an extended uh, view of the business. For example, with Watson, when you go under Armour and, and the BM Watson are collaborating to use analytics for one, mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for example, sport uh, result in order to, to build better product. So you need to share your data. And this is probably where is the obstacle at this moment for me. Right. So there are still obstacles, there are still challenges. Some are technological, but many of them are also management leadership uh, issues. Right. Now, uh, uh, Jean-Philippe, um, you know, with the IBM Watson, we have already, I mean, with the Watson product, if you want to talk for that, about that for a moment, we have a developed product that, yeah. that you are selling to companies, right? Sure. Uh, so, so, so how is that going? I mean, I'm reading things like, <clears throat> you know, Watson is putting uh, as the legal analysts out of business and Watson is going to um, uh, do better diagnoses than the, 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 the doctors even for cancer, right? I'm reading uh, Watson does better in HR hiring, so, uh, Sounds like a very, very advanced uh, product to me. Okay, so thank you first. Um, so maybe just to, to, to share with you a little bit what we do and, and what is Watson, because Watson is a buzzword and we are putting behind it many things, and I think maybe too many things. Uh, point number one, to make a long story short, Watson is a, a cognitive platform. And I use the word cognitive on purpose, because uh, I think that AI means artificial intelligence. First of all, we should talk about AI as augmented intelligence rather than AI as artificial intelligence. And point number three, I think that the, we are entering right now in a, a complete new era. I'm very convinced of that. It's a complete new game, complete new game, which will transform everything. I think it will be fact-based. It, it, it is what will happen. And it is all about cogni sciences. Cogni sciences. And to go back to Watson, Watson is a cognitive platform available for everybody, developers, corporates, or anybody who wants to do an AI-centric project. And this platform is covering basically six big items. Item number one is about language, everything which will be around between human and the machine. We will interact with machine in a complete new way in the next years, complete new way about understanding of the language, the generation of the language, about understanding, so language number one. Point number two, voice. Everything will be voice-centric. Point number three will be visual recognition. Point number four will be empathy, sentiment, emotion, personality, about high reasoning capability, and finally about knowledge management. And if you take these six things, six items, behind each of them, you have what we call in the IBM world some APIs. This is now very well known. And these APIs are covering each of these items and are available on this platform. I think that the battle today about around AI will be a platform battle. And to, again, to go, to go directly to the, to, to the point, because we can discuss that during hours, it's a very passionating uh, subject, it's about platform because at the end of the day, we will need one intelligence and a multi-channel strategy. And if we want to be consistent with the intelligence, you need to have a platform. You need to invest in this platform. You do to do a lot of R&D around this platform to make your service better and better because now we are working in a complete new game, which is a learning world. We are no more in the programming world. And Wired magazine, a few years ago in the US, said, this is the end of code. I love these four words. This is the end of code. The code was a programming world, deterministic, rules-based. It's over. I will, <laughs> deny, I will deny to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's come back on that. Well, you mentioned, <laughs> Let's come back on you that. mentioned yeah. emotions being and part of this too, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I f uh, emotion is something else. Uh, uh, again, uh, we can discuss what emotion We'll, we'll get back it, to it, that it, one. It, it, you, <laughs> we will. And um, we will. It's very <coughs> again. But again, I go back to my point about programming learning. Programming deterministic, rules based. You know exactly where you are going. The learning one, as us every day today, we are transferring a part of our knowledge to the machine, on a certain extent. We are transferring a part of the know-how, the, the 
expertise, what you do with the knowledge, and a certain extent, we are transferring something around our personality. So this is a real exchange between human beings and the machine together, which are learning from each other, at least hopefully. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Good okay. to have you. Uh, Tim, um, before we talk about Woven, you were with uh, Facebook actually for many yes, years, right? Yes. Um, so, um, when you compare like, uh, what happened the last 15, 20 years in terms of the digital revolution, and, uh, and I was sketching something along the lines of, well, there was the internet, and there's e-commerce, and then there's the mobile platforms, and there's social media, and that sort of thing, and Facebook played a role there. Mm -hmm. If you compare this world to this, I heard the word, radical transformation of everything now, uh, mm -hmm. do you share this notion of we, are in a, we will be in a totally different world within the next few years? Again, I do, um, although I have a, a slightly more skeptical perspective on things. So my, my background, uh, I, I was a two-time CIO. I was the CIO for a company called KLA Tinkor and then for Facebook for uh, almost seven years. And uh, at Facebook, the role of the CIO is the productivity of the workforce. And during my tenure at Facebook, we doubled the productivity uh, of Facebook as measured by revenue per employee. And technology was a key aspect of doubling the productivity of the company. Uh, we found all the opportunities to eliminate the mundane tasks and have the machine do that for people and had transformative impact on the success of the company uh, by doing those things. But at the same time, uh, I think that we, you know, there's a concept in technology of uh, J curves and S curves. So in a J curve, it looks like a J, uh, but when you have massive adoption of technology, you have this seemingly uh, you know, exponential scale that uh, you're going to achieve in terms of uh, outcome for the amount of input that you put into the system. Applied here uh, for artificial intelligence and technology, we're at the beginning of this transition to AI and we're starting to see some pretty phenomenal impact on workforces. But the difference between a J-curve and an S-curve is at some point in an S-curve, you start to get diminishing returns. It gets more, more and more difficult. And uh, there is an industry here that has been in AI for over a decade that has been experiencing this, and that's self-driving automobiles, where you have cars that had some capability to drive on their own without a human, uh, in 2008, 2010, but we still don't have uh, a taxi service that will drive us around without a driver. And the reason for this uh, is because at some point it gets more and more difficult to teach the machine the last aspects of how to deal with ambiguous circumstance. And uh, I believe that we uh, are overestimating the opportunity of um, AI and the impact that it's going to have in the workforce because in many cases it will follow this S-curve uh, approach as opposed to a J-curve. That it will become harder and harder for uh, the machines to take the humans out when you get to the most advanced aspect of things. So the trick for uh, organizations, particularly for digital technology leaders, is to know where it's, still, it's cost effective to apply the technology. And really, when you look at what are machines good at and what are humans good at, they're good at very, very different things. Uh, an example of this um, that we experienced at Facebook, which is um, something people uh, might uh, easily understand, is content moderation. Mm -hmm. So it is very easy to teach a machine to find things that look like inappropriate content, particularly when it comes to language or even uh, image material, but uh, it's not perfect. Uh, you can see the image of a breastfeeding woman and is that pornography or is that um, more of a political statement or you know, is it appropriate or inappropriate and m in many cases it requires human judgment to determine what the right classification is. So machines can go and do the initial work to search through millions and millions of posts to identify inappropriate content. Um, but for the, the last 1%, you still need to have humans involved. And you've seen this with Facebook with all of the recent problems that it's had. It's had to significantly increase its staff, not because it doesn't have enough uh, software engineers to build AI systems to do these things, because the AI can only go so far and the humans have to do the final Th that's, piece. That's very, very interesting. Um, uh, so, so, so what you're saying basically is uh, um, that 
there may always be a difference, right? Uh, or maybe the difference will also be in the perception. So even when a system has passed the Turing test, and if you th the Turing test is basically you can't tell anymore whether you're interacting with a human or you're interacting with a machine, um, even when that is happening, it's still not the same the way a human does it and the machine does it, which the philosophers call the Chinese room puzzle, by the way. Right. So, right, so, um, uh, so if you know you're interacting with a system, a machine, rather than a human, you may be reacting differently. Yeah. And that's been captured by this idea of the uncanny valley. You may feel freaked out, a little eerie, and that sort of thing. Maybe we'll get back to that later on. But Woven, tell me about your, your so new company. So my business is productivity. And uh, what uh, I learned at Facebook is that productivity in the age of the knowledge worker uh, is uh, probably the most important aspect of life to focus on. Uh, so for what Woven is about is helping people spend time on the things that matter most to them. And if you think about it, for a knowledge worker, time is the most valuable asset that they have. No matter how wealthy anyone is, we all have only 24 hours in a day. And so the decisions that we make on how to spend our time are the most valuable decisions that we can possibly make. So what Woven is about is helping people um, uh, make those decisions uh, more effectively. And to do that, first, we have to help them learn how to spend time with the system. That, you, know, you could think of that as being a replacement for a traditional calendaring system. Mm -hmm. uh, but the second part, which is where it gets really interesting, is understanding what is good time and what is bad mm -hmm. time. What are the most important things for people? And that requires a much right. deeper understanding of uh, an individual's priorities. And, and that's what the company does, yes. yeah. So, so there's the issue of <clears throat> helping humans to become more productive, mm -hmm. but there's also the issue of replacing humans, right? So I'd like uh, each one of you to tell me which jobs do you think uh, will be replaced over the next five to ten years, and one job I'm particularly interested in is, of course, my own, you know? Will there still be a professor, a human professor, rather than a robot, or maybe an AI system? We don't need the human presence anymore, so it can be either the AI in a, in a physical presence like a robot or just an AI system. Will that be the alternative over the next uh, five, ten years? Uh, Mark, what is yeah, your yeah. view on I, this? I, I'm, here, uh, I'm, I'm very impatient to answer this question because it's very interesting. There's two aspects, and we have seen that. Um, the, the, the teacher, there's a technical way to learn things, and we are talking about cognitive, so yeah, always technical things like English. For example, if you look at Liu Liu Shu, yeah, sorry if I don't pronounce it well, it's a Chinese uh, company, startup. Uh, which is doing a real good agent to, to, to learn uh, English with your smartphone. So you don't need, it just recognize and voice recognition is very easy now for not only IBM but also Microsoft and all this uh, uh, person at Google. So uh, you discuss and every week you have this uh, ability and uh, your, your, your capability to, to learn English more and more. And really it's, uh, you don't need a teacher, it's uh, AI. So <coughs> it's really interesting but it's some f somewhere technical. There's no intuition, I don't know if it's the same name in English, intuition or uh, in, in the sense of emotion. There's nothing else. And the personal behavior you have, you have conviction, you have decision. So this is where it's in, in interesting. <coughs> you can have this technical aspect, you can teach <coughs> with uh, AI, right. but when you, in your book, you do bold conviction, this is very personal, <coughs> it's this neuronal aspect that we cannot, I think, and I uh, agree sometimes with uh, some of my colleagues, I think we will never reach with an AI, because there's a part of perception, maybe love, maybe some emotion, primitive emotion, but we will not reach. This so there'll still be a role, you're saying, for the yes. teacher and the classroom. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, so which jobs will go? Uh, I think we will, you, you talk about medicine, healthcare, of course, is uh, one of the things very <coughs> interesting. I, we cannot replace uh, 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 med um, uh, medicine in general, uh, uh, specialists and professional, but uh, you can be helped very much uh, with, with AI. And of course, you have all what we call the manufacturing aspect, very simple task, mm -hmm. because what we try to achieve here is to augment uh, and help uh, uh, the human and not replace it. I, I disagree when we say disagree. We try to help that, and give yeah. free, free time Agreed. for the brain. Agreed. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's been also the message of IBM Watson for several years, right? We are helping, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, my guess was always, sure, that's there to build the business, but ultimately you will replace people, no? Okay. Um, I think... Uh, 
first of all, what do we do today with, with Watson? And more broadly, AI, <coughs> not only Watson, it's not a protocol, right. but Watson is about AI and the cognitive system. What we do three things, uh, if I have to summarize the situation today. First of all, we are working very heavily in everything around customer exper experience, UI, UX. All the interaction between human and machine will be changed in the next 15 years, everything. You can, what we have done in the last 20 years about digital, about uh, your tablet, your app, very sexy, gamification and so on, we need to review all of this because we have new capabilities in hands based on cognitive system which will impact the interaction between us collectively and the machine world. Point number one. This is a complete change in the customer experience mm -hmm. space. So we have many things to do. Fantastic pace. Second point, uh, domain of activity for us, it's about enhancing knowledge worker. This is really where we are working on what we call virtual assistant, which are uh, putting things in place to augment and power people in their jobs. You talk about later, you talk before you talk about healthcare, medicine, doctor, oncology, it's, a, it's true for banking, it's true for telco, it's true for you, it's true for me, for my friend in Accenture. We will be, and we are already impacted by all this system, and it's just the beginning of the journey. So the, my point is not to think during hours about replacement, augmentation, is how we are able to transform ourselves to be able to collaborate with this new machine. I understand. In fact, there, there is a term for that, cyborgs, you know? We enhance our, our own uh, uh, cognitive thinking and, and even bodies. Uh, through technology and, tra and change ourselves into Absolutely. into you and it's already the case. You're absolutely correct. And the last domain of application of AI today, which is a very big one also, it's all about process. We are coming from uh, again a rules-based process world. We have done some BPR in the 70s, business process engineering. We have done some automatization like hell. Boom, boom, Taylor, uh, specialization of the task and so on. We have done some lean activity in the last 10 years. It was very trendy. So we have lean everything. And now we, not, we need to think about how we are able to inject AI within the process in order to achieve the next step right. with smart processes. And what does that mean? It means, it's very simple, this process will be able to learn about their own performance. So. I try to summarize these three big domains and my conviction today, but this is my conviction today, I do AI since now 10 years. I was based in Singapore, New York, Paris now, and my takeaway is I avoid now every black and white situation because I have, been, I have done so many surprises in the last 10 years, many things I was thinking was impossible was possible, and many things was I was thinking possible are, were, are not possible today. So my point is, and so my only conviction today is we need to be prepared, and we, I think we are not, to work with this new system. And it's all about education, it's all about change management, it's all about soft skills and not only hard skills. We are too much focusing on hard skills today. So uh, interesting what you're saying. So basically it means <clears throat> when I teach my technology course in the spring, new course, which will be offered by Columbia in the spring, um, <clears throat> I could have a... <clears throat> Uh, an assistant, uh, a machine, a robot, right? As a teaching assistant and so on, but I would still be needed in the classroom. Absolutely. Okay. This is my, this is my uh, yeah. Very good news. I saved your job today. <laughs> <laughs> today <for you. laughs> so, Tim, what's, <laughs> what's your view? Which jobs <laughs> will be affected and, and how will they be working with AI and maybe take that position rather than replace? And what happens to me? So I think there's, there's three uh, criteria. There's other reasons you should be worried about your job. I'll get to that in a second. <laughs> the three three criterion, um, which, which I think can be applied to, to any role. The first is, is this a highly repetitive task? Uh, highly repetitive tasks are, have always been ripe for automation. And what's happening with AI systems is that the intelligence of the systems allow them to do things that, um, more things than they were able to do in the past. It's very much governed by the second issue, is how much ambiguity is there. When there's not a lot of ambiguity, the machine is going to outperform the human all the time. Uh, especially when it's a highly repetitive task because machines don't get bored, they don't get tired, they don't need to be motivated, they just do their jobs. Um, but if you have things that are very ambiguous, this is where humans shine. Like when you change the rules all of a sudden or you're facing a circumstance you've never seen before, the machine gets confused and, and needs help, whereas uh, the human it can improvise. The third thing, which I think a lot of companies overlook, is how much emotional interaction is there with uh, the human. 
So the more that we try to anthropomorphize technology with you know, Siri, Alexa, things like right. that, we create a, a slight expectation problem because when humans interact with um, technology that is purporting to be uh, human-like, we expect to have an emotional connection to it. And you've already mm -hmm. seen Apple and Amazon try to inject a little bit of humor and empathy into their responses, but they do a very poor job of this because it's very hard. Uh, human emotional interaction is very complex and it's the most difficult aspect of a machine to mimic. So when you need empathy, uh, the machine is not going to, do, to outperform the human. So now let's apply this to a couple of examples. Uh, if you take, for example, customer service, well, that's highly repetitive, and for at least the initial line of customer service, there's not a lot of ambiguity. Um, and so those are things that uh, can be uh, automated, and you already see that with more bots being the front line of support. Mm -hmm. But you can't go very far with that because of that third issue of empathy. When, if you care about your customers and they're not happy with a problem that they have, you very immediately need to build an emotional rapport mm -hmm. with them. And but you can fake this. When I go to luxury hotels, you know, I show up at the, uh, you know, the person at the front desk greets me and says, oh, it's so great to see you again, uh, Professor Schmidt. Um, how are you? Um, you know, how has your trip been? Blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure. They are really empathizing with me. I'm not sure they express their true emotions. They may be faking it. And a machine can do that too, no? Yeah. No, I think humans are very good at perceiving this. Um, because the machine it will be coded a set of responses, and we are far more complex than just a, a few if then mm. statements. So I would detect it yourself. Yes, yes, okay. I think you would. And it, it, you see that when Siri doesn't do what you want, the most common emotional reaction is anger. Humans get angry when the machine does not respond the way that they expect it to. So it's, it's not a good uh, substitute in a customer service example. But if you go into uh, the world of a paralegal, for example, we were talking about smart contracts yeah. earlier. Well, again, highly repetitive, not very ambiguous, no emotion is required in that case. And so that is a ripe position for uh, digital automation with the new uh, capabilities of AI-based systems. Okay, very good. Uh, I'd like to open it up uh, to your questions. Of course, we'll have microphones going around. Uh, please identify yourself, say uh, who you are, and, uh, and the microphone will then be coming. I see a gentleman over there. Can it's we fair. get the microphone Sorry. to the row there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then also maybe uh, the gentleman over there next. So please, <clears throat> please identify yourself and... Uh, and the question. Um, my name is Zorin. I'm an alumni club leader from Chicago. Forgive me my voice. Uh, met too many alumni last night. <laughs> um, uh, the last uh, manufacturing, uh, the last, uh, let's say, foot uh, assembly, uh, a lot of what you're discussing is services, digital and technology. But there's a tremendous amount of manufacturing that goes not only in our host country here, um, but around the world. How does AI or some of the areas that you're discussing um, impact that? Uh, you uh, touched upon a um, little bit. Uh, well, right now we have, uh, let's say, in auto manufacturing, we've had uh, for over a decade or longer a simplistic machines or robots. Um, how does what you're discussing impact that last uh, 10 centimeters uh, in, in assembly, in manufacturing, in improvement in quality. Who would like to take the first mark? No, I, I can start. Yeah, it's so it's interesting because we are talking, often you will hear, oh, I use the, the term uh, digital house. So if you imagine manufacturing is part, is one of a process of a, a wider process. And um, when you, uh, build and when you, you do and you transport, you do all this, uh, let's say, successive uh, um, uh, sequence or activities, you will see that the first thing is the robotization, which is really, uh, there's nothing about AI in, but really you do tasks, repetitive tasks, very simple. And then you can start with uh, what we call IoT, so you put uh, some of sensor in your system of manufacturing and you will bring your system information system with much more uh, information. This information linked to, we are still in the house, with a consumer, for example, or your B2B or your connectors, 
uh, you will have the opportunity to uh, fit better with uh, wha what happened. And what is interesting, we call it uh, sto stochastic uh, predictability, which is uh, you can guess with AI and try to be help in terms of planning, uh, routing, uh, shipping if you have, uh, building, so every single of activity can be enhanced by uh, AI in order to be more accurate. And this is not only uh, in the sense, let's say, of um, doing your technical activity, but also maybe to monitor and to um, uh, look what the, the world, the consumer, are, are trying to do or looking for. And this loop, uh, this, this uh, cycle is very interesting. At this moment, it's a smart business, a small business, let's say, because it's difficult, but imagine that since you start with uh, uh, shoes or something like that, and you can see what is the impact of your, your, your brand and your shoes directly in the end user, and you can immediately uh, look back and do again this uh, complete manufacturing with these new features because you have seen your uh, end cons consumer is, is, is expecting, you can have here what we call the, the, the virtual and, and the um, interesting uh, uh, loop uh, around digital. And this is probably where we have the, the most uh, interest to put AI in order to enhance the wall uh, transfer. And, but you see it's a house because we are talking about probably uh, manufacturing, robots, sensors, yeah. but also the front office. Mm. So you have probably a bot which is talking to your consumers, will complain, social media to see the reaction. Mm. So this big house I is a big mm. one. In manufacturing specifically, of course, mm. what we try to achieve is really specialized in terms of planification, even if I was referring to VUCA, and in VUCA we say that the planification yeah. is, is dead, we should not planify, but just do what you need to do at the right moment. Mm -hmm. And the only way to find this moment is probably to be help with something which is looking in real time what happened on the market. Um, yeah, I fully agree with what you said. Uh, manufacturing will be heavily impacted by what is happening. And the reason is, as you said, because manufacturing is a world where everything is now converging. Uh, AI, data, IoT, sensors and the cloud. Everything in the same sector, which is maybe not completely true for other uh, domains of businesses. So when you have all these things which are converging by definition and by design, the impact will be super, super important. Point number two, uh, we don't talk anymore about robotics, we talk about, uh, first, it's not only work, but uh, um, the world is um, not robotic, it's con cogni uh, cognitive, in fact a mix between cognitive and robotic. And in fact, this is really expressing the fact that now things are merging together. And the last thing is, in the old factories, you, you know, you have, uh, I have the chance, when I was uh, in, in Asia, I was traveling a lot in Japan, and one day I had a chance to visit a, a company, and Carlos Ghosn will be there uh, later, yep. I think. So, it will be much more <laughs> reliable than me on this domain. Uh, not only this domain, by the way. But uh, in fact, uh, you have now the old factory with the old chain, you know, which was completely separate with the workers because these robots w were quite dangerous with the human being because it can be dangerous if you are working with this machine. And I think now you start to see robots, real robots, which are working very closely with human being because a worker can teach the machine to do something. And how he is doing or she is doing that, he takes the robot, shows to the robot how to do things, and the robot starts to understand what he or she <laughs> has to do in the way to do the activity. So this world is very fascinating because, again, as we said, machine and human are now really working together much more than in the past. You, you, you see what I mean? I try to express what I saw in this factory, Tesla. which was quite okay. in, impressive. Tesla, Tesla so was a good example. I, Tesla. Absolutely. Right. Um, let's take a question over there, please. Good morning. Thank you very much for stimulating a conversation. My name is Ellen Ellison. I'm the Chief Investment Officer of the University of Illinois Foundation based in Chicago. Uh, and it's taking me 25 years uh, post-Columbia to, uh, in what is largely an apprenticeship learning process, to understand all asset classes have a great depth of knowledge that is very broad and also very deep. There's been a lot of work done in investment management and finance um, with automated learning and AI. So how does 
how I would be interested in either of any of you answering how AI might be influencing um, very complex interactive decision making in investing where you know, pattern recognition is very important, but how do machines learn the judgment that I've learned over 25 years? Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, you know, that is a space where you have a significant amount of transactional data. And this, in today's world, this is the lifeblood of AI systems. When you have a rich data pool uh, from which to look at uh, past decisioning and the effectiveness of those decisions uh, from which to make good predictions in, in the future. And so I think financial services um, is one of the areas where uh, machines can actually, uh, I won't say that they'll outperform hu humans because there is a gut interaction on certain decisions in financial services that a machine will never have. But there's a wealth of information that's just impossible for us to process as individuals. There's only so much information that we can read, consume, understand, and make sense of. And machines have the opportunity to look across much deeper and much larger data sets for which in financial services you have just uh, a mountain of uh, information. I think one of the things that will be interesting is whether that the need for um, data uh, and how much uh, data is necessary to make uh, effective predictions uh, stays at the level that it is. Right now, you know, one of the reasons why companies like Facebook and Apple and, and Google are, are leaders in AI is that they have a, just an incredible amount of data from which to make the predictions that they have to make, whether that's an advertising prediction or a user prediction. Um, but, uh, you know, as we were talking about uh, earlier, the advancements in the algorithms are getting to the point where you can make decisions with just a few, uh, much less data points. And if you think about expertise in, uh, you know, in, in our world, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, looking at a financial statement or uh, looking at a piece of art, a human can make a judgment with a very a uh, small amount of data, and as machines get more and more intelligent, they'll start to approximate more of our capabilities in that area. And I will try to, to give my, my input to, to, to feed your thoughts. Uh, when I was based in Singapore, I was working for a big uh, Singaporean bank in the wealth management space, which is my core skills. And it was really high net worth individuals, so top guys with uh, a lot of money and a lot of problems to, to fix. And um, we did a project with the relationship managers of this bank. And basically, we did three use cases. Use case number one was identify and target, which is basically who I need to talk to and why. Use case number two was when I, when I know who I need to talk to and why, I, will be, I need to be prepared, because these guys have everything except time, to make a long story short. And uh, use case number three where, where was when I, need, when I know who I need to talk to and why, I need to recommend something some scenario, and we know that in financial services there is no one answer, there is some scenarios, and maybe one of them is a good one for me. It's very complex. And to make a long story short, uh, I was working with a lady who was leading this project, and at the end of the project, I told her what I brought you, on a professional standpoint, of course. And she answered, basically, you put us, the relationship managers, in a non-comfort zone. I said, what do you mean by non-comfort zone? In fact, she understood everything. She told me, Jean-Philippe, you know, your machine is now providing some recommendation that I was not thinking about. Your machine is bringing, providing me, some recommendation, financial recommendations, mm. which were not in my mind. And this is the power of this machine. This machine have, have no comfort zone. Even the word comfort zone for this machine doesn't mean anything. They are bringing together, collecting data, calling this data, bringing together from some things which seems uh, reasonable, rational, and bringing you some recommendations. And this is where this collaboration needs to happen, because I need to be open-minded to accept the fact that a machine can bring me something which maybe is relevant or maybe not relevant. Right. And this is where your expertise is key to build based on this one. Point number two, these machines are evidence-based. Evidence-based. We are all of us very emotional by, by design. Human being is emotional. And we have so many BAs, and we know that. These machines are evidence-based, which means that when the recommendation is provided by the machine, all the evidence, all the facts which are behind the recommendation are brought to the relationship managers. And this point is very important, because we know that in financial services, the key challenge is trust. I don't trust anymore banks and you.
I know that you are just pushing products to me. And the only way to restore trust between customers and banks and financial institutions and so on is potentially to bring some facts behind the recommendation. These systems are, by design, evidence-based system, probabilistic, not deterministic. Thank you. Um, we still have a lot of questions, so I suggest that you uh, identify yourself. Maybe also one person who would answer it. We'll also keep our answers as short as possible because okay. it, we yeah. just have 10 minutes okay. left. We do an effort. Please. Like. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eduardo Rossi. I work at a family office in Brazil. My question is about ethics um, on two fronts. One is the cyborg. Uh, what ethical discussions have been happening regarding the potential uh, interaction between man and machine. And the second one is about data. So data is the most valuable asset in the world. Uh, whoever collects the most data faster can get great power. But data, differently from any other asset, when you accumulate it, it doesn't get taxed. It doesn't get shared. So. Uh, I wanted to hear a little bit about that. Right. Maybe, Mark, uh, we talked a little bit about philosophical and ethical issues before, as a matter of fact, right? So uh, do you want to take that question? Cyborgs yeah. as well as data. Yeah, so cyborgs, um, imagine, so there's three uh, big family, let's say, in, in the way we, we see uh, AI in general. Uh, the first is something that helps human, something uh, which is looking like a human with the intention to replace it and the human augmented by physical connection and physical device into the body, into the brain. This is, uh, we were referring to this. Or genetic uh, engineering or, or yeah. brain simulations. Like there are some commercialized products already. Like exactly. Sure. So if you look at Sophia, you were referring to Sophia. Sophia is, is, is a robot and she has a Arabi, uh, Saudi she has Ara Yeah, she has citizenship in Saudi Arabia, right? right. And she appears at talk shows. Yeah, so she, she can discuss world. with you. The idea behind that, and which, which is very interesting in terms of ethics and, and what we, 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 uh, how we behave with robots, and, but there's tons to, to say about it because we say it's a kind of embodiment of, uh, of persona. We have uh, someone in front of us, but indeed we are missing something very important is we are accumulating uh, data, we are replicating what the human is doing, but we are not human. And this is based more on the genetic aspect for the moment and we will see later on the brain. So coming back to your, your question or your, your aspect on, on, uh, on data and power, uh, this is a much more uh, longer debate. Here uh, we have tons of data and we have uh, monetization. And for me, the, the important thing around the data is uh, to protect it in the reasonable way, reasonable way. Because if we believe at this moment the data is the most important and the most financial impacting uh, the business, uh, um, uh, things, um, we need to protect it, but I was saying that one of the key trends is to share the data. So there's probably missing somewhere a space, protected space, where we all can share our data in order to do things not against us, but for us. And this is probably where is the link between ethics and business. So I engage everybody and every one of us to think about what we consider as moral in using the data for a consumer and a personal. And, and this is probably the most important trend we will see in the next years, because most of the brand, and this is uh, for you, Professor, uh, will probably have to deal with what is my impact, social impact, but also impact as a brand when I use data in a bad way for mm -hmm. someone, what is the impact on my consumer, and what is the impact as my brand. So the market may react. Good. Um, let's take some more questions. The gentleman maybe over there in the middle, standing Hi, up. Nick Whittle, uh, class of 97, I guess. A bit of a follow-on to part one of Edward's question, uh, and um, sort of going back to uh, what happens to Professor Schmidt's job over the next <laughs> five to ten years. Um, it's maybe a little Gibson-esque, but um, what happens when you get a class full of highly competitive alpha MBA students who all decide to augment themselves through AI, through cyborg, through your genetic engineering. And does Professor Schmidt's job actually become relevant or exist any further when everybody is sort of in a, an AI genetic arms race? I think in some respects we're already there. Uh, you know, if you're a student in a classroom today, you have a laptop, you open up the laptop, the 
professor starts talking about something. And well, first off, if it's interesting and captivating, you're paying attention. Um, <laughs> and if it's not, then, then there's maybe different problems. But more importantly, you, know, you have Google right there. So any fact that is mm. conveyed in sure. the classroom, the students already have immediate access to you know, whether or not that fact is accurate and a whole trove of information. And so in many respects, uh, right there, a web browser and a student, you've just created a, a, a cyborg that... You're absolutely right. I mean, how do you think I put my lectures together, right? I go to <laughs> Google, I go to Wiki, and that's it. Well, and I think it, it, it actually creates... <laughs> Not quite, but pretty close. It, it, it creates a circumstance where you have to differentiate in, in different ways. What, right. what is it that I can tell you that you can't read online, right? Either from experience, um, and then, you know, the, the other issue, which I think gets back to, uh, you know, is, is your uh, position safe, uh, is how do you protect that IP? Mm. Because as soon as you come up with that new innovative concept that you want to teach mm. your classroom, that's information that can be easily disseminated. Right. So it, it is a very interesting conundrum for people who are in the content business. How do you protect that right. differentiation? So it's not just for my job, but it's, it's for a whole range of categories. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, maybe we'll go over here again. Yes, the gentleman. And then maybe we'll have the lady in the front next. Yeah. So, Laszlo Syriac uh, with iEurope, uh, with Christina. And thank you. It's a fantastic panel. My question is, uh, following up on the ethics, um, is Europe, Europe and Silicon Valley think very differently about mm -hmm. this data. Where are we heading? Uh, and then you have Russia, China questions about data. Mm -hmm. Where are we heading? Are we going to be in a regulated environment? Are we going to have self-regulation? What's going to come? What are your predictions? <laughs> It's I think this one. is a really, really tough yeah, one. Yeah, it's a tough uh, one. You, sorry. <laughs> but the G, GPDR, so yeah. that's part of the response has been around the GPDR, for, of course, or so in Europe, uh, you, you're probably familiar with the rule around protection of data. But, but your question is also dealing with uh, the intention of some countries or businesses to uh, attack. We are, we are talking about cyber security here and protection of data in terms of sensitive data like um, commercial data or client customer data. So here, what we uh, are probably missing and what could happen is we have one scenario where indeed, uh, mainly in US, uh, the, the GAFA and, and big users and Alibaba, if you, if you, if you take also a Chinese aspect, uh, try to uh, accept and collaborate uh, within a kind of standard of protection and ethics. So it's difficult, we can say a moratoire, but it's always difficult to wait for that in front of a business. Second thing is, are we able to regulate uh, Europe first uh, with, with strong law and how laws can deal with this business and day-to-day cyber security problem, knowing that Europe is a small part of the world. So here I do believe that the only way we have to save ourselves is to do auto-regulation, like we have done in the past, we need to put probably standards and accept a level of responsibility for each of us. So having said that, it's funny, or maybe it's nothing because you say, please take your responsibility. But what is interesting is if we create spaces where you have a, um, a, the, the safe uh, place to deal with your data, and you can bring that on the market, and you can make people, individual, so citizen, but also as a consumer, be sure that you are giving your data to the right person at the right moment, probably you will enhance and probably enable a more safe business and, and put this space we are looking for. But it's a little bit virtual. I, I don't have prediction around it. What I see is the only auto-regulated will, will work because I don't think that the, the states, the country, yeah. the government will do the same thing and accept all that uh, uh, global law in the world will be uh, like uh, in, in, uh, in uh, your new Sorry, uh, you, um, right. you in French, in English, European, European country? Uh, no, uh, around the war. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, around the war. This is the same problem. Uh, we need yeah. a lot of maturity yeah. To, yeah. to have this kind Understood. of flow. We take one last question. We have five seconds for the question, ten seconds yeah. for the answer. There was Go. a lady right here in the front, please. Watson. And then we need to finish up. That's challenging. Um, so <laughs> we heard about Alex Tao, you know, scandal recently in the US where you know, it leaked some information from a family and they just sent it out to, to a colleague. So it was completely irrelevant. I was wondering in your experience, 
where is it that AI is actually mature? Is it, you know, manufacturing? What, what is in technology from a technology perspective? Where is AI mature? What are the use cases that we can actually apply now without having to worry about the consequences of it? Okay. Uh, so maybe I will... Uh, to, um, uh, just on, on, really, just time uh, out, 10 seconds. So we... Just one thing. Yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I really like you. We need see to replace the, you. We, we need to replace you. Not <laughs> 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 no, I took the decision now. It's <laughs> over. <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, it's, it's a joke, it's a joke, uh, and provocative, <laughs> the French uh, humor, well, anyway, so, uh, <laughs> it's cultural, but anyway, um, no, about that, the, the, uh, we did uh, just a, a, big, a big study last week, and we have published this study, to make a long story short, the main obstacle for AI uh, scale-up is about trust and transparency. This is the main obstacle today that we have to fix it. If we don't fix it, we will not scale AI. And to fix it, it's a big topic, and trust and transparency with AI on many topics. This is, this is the data, this is the algorithm, this is the learning. It, it's impacted many things in the AI world. But again, to make a long story short, we, we need, and we, this is what we have announced last week, for the first time, we have uh, announced a solution which is able to detect in real time on an open ecosystem world, it's working for every ML machine learning system, any editors, Google, Azure, uh, Watson, or whatever, we are able now to detect BAs in real time, to qualify them, and to mitigate them. But now, I will, do, I will tell you the reality. If you think that AI has no BAs, you are wrong. By design, AI has, AI, as some BAs, because AI are coming from us, and we are full of BAs. So we need to be inclusive, and if we are not inclusive, we will not make a cognitive system on an AI trusted and transparent. Good. Ah, so, <laughs> thank you. Merci. Hein. So, Merci à toi. so Merci that... Toi. So the good, robot though. professor Thank declares the session to be finished. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Nice job. Okay.